Welcome to uh, the panel. Uh, the idea is for us to have a chat today uh, to talk about AI from a financier's perspective. Uh, I guess some of the questions we want to answer today are uh, what are the social benefits of AI, uh, but also what are the different approaches in terms of investing uh, in this sector today. So, uh, as mentioned, I'm joined by uh, Samir Kumar, who's the Managing Director of M12, Microsoft's Venture Fund. Uh, this was set up in 2016. It now has about 65 uh, portfolio companies, and uh, uh, obviously the fund uh, looks at early stage investment in these startups. Um, I also want to remind you to please send through your questions through Pigeonhole. Um, uh, I will be putting them to uh, Samir as the session goes on, so please feel free to send them over whenever you would like and not necessarily wait till the end of the session. So um, I guess uh, the first uh, question I wanted to uh, ask you, Samir, is if we had to look at how AI has uh, developed so far, what do you think, how do you think, or what kind of um, biggest effect AI could have on our day-to-day -day lives? Uh, <coughs> thanks, Stefania, and it's great to be here. So, uh, you know, for most of us, if we think about uh, how do we see AI impacting our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, one of the areas I'm most excited about, and it should come as no surprise, is uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, and if you think about the idea of a robot that all of us are going to interact with, uh, whether it's sitting in our garage, whether it's a robot that we lease or rent out, whether it's a robot that we share with others, uh, it, that is probably one of the applications that, uh, if you think about, you know, at the, at the nexus of all of the advancements we're seeing in the fields of computer vision, in deep learning, in reinforcement learning, uh, and the impact it's going to have on our society in terms of transforming transportation, transforming mobility, uh, allowing a lot more people to be able to benefit from being able to move around, and uh, I think autonomous vehicles is definitely one of the top applications. I guess we could argue, though, that the biggest effect will come when we can actually roll out autonomous vehicles at scale. Um, are we there yet? Uh, and where do you see us, or when do you see us achieving this kind uh, of uh, target? Yeah, it's a, so if you think about, uh, you know, just today, uh, Waymo, uh, for example, announced that they're doing now uh, commercial deployments in Phoenix, Arizona. So you, you see a lot of signal where, hey, this is happening this year, or this is going to start happening next year. Uh, I'm perhaps a little bit more conservative. Uh, my opinion is this is still a little bit further out. It's one thing to get to the 90% uh, scenario where it works in most uh, environments. It's a whole other thing to get to that 99.99 or 999% where you could have uh, autonomous vehicles uh, without a driver or without even a safety driver driving in places like New York uh, or even in Singapore. Um, and certainly you've seen companies like Newtonomy that were acquired by Delphi and, and Aptiv uh, that are doing trials in places like Singapore. So I think there is more work to be done uh, to make this work at scale in commercial environments, uh, but we are making good progress. And uh, it also creates opportunity for uh, investors uh, that are looking to invest in autonomy startups. It's not just about the full stack robo taxi providers. It's about everything that's in the ecosystem, uh, including all of the different enablers, everything from people doing simulation to people doing cybersecurity to people doing uh, data tools um, to people doing teleoperations. Um, all of these things are valuable. And I think regardless of how long it takes for us all to be in a position where no matter where we go, we can experience uh, a robo taxi, these enabling technologies uh, do offer promise for investors uh, in addition to you know, the, uh, the, full, the full stack vertically integrated uh, autonomy plays. Um, I guess, as you mentioned, we still might be a, a sort of a short while or a long while away from seeing this really being rolled out at scale, yet there, uh, you could also argue there's quite a big hype around uh, any company, any firm involved uh, in autonomous vehicles. I mean, uh, we were discussing this and you're also making the point that none of these companies really have uh, seen any revenue so far, yet there's so much focus from the investment community. Could you tell us a little bit about what you think about that and where you see this going in the autonomous vehicle space specifically? Yeah, so if you think about the overall opportunity, it's a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. If you think about transportation and mobility, uh, even this year, we've seen, I think, close to five billion in VC money go into automotive startups. And the vast majority of that is, in fact, going into uh, autonomy players or those in the autonomy ecosystem. So the question is, if you think about all the typical metrics 
that as an investor you would apply to what stage you're investing in a company, uh, why are we still seeing so much money go into these companies? I think we all believe that this is a transformative uh, technology that is going to have long-term, you know, high magnitude changes on society. And in certain cases, you're okay. You're okay with waiting to see when those changes will happen. And if you think about uh, autonomous vehicles as an application of AI, you also look at uh, you know, what, what have been the trends and exits in AI companies. And in fact, those have all been for talent, for data, and for high valuations, uh, significant exits. And it hasn't been about well, they're generating this much revenue or they have this much recurring revenue. It's about the fact that you're making a bet that the core capabilities in talent, in know-how, uh, and in data are going to pay off in one way, shape, or form. And to some extent, that also applies to those in the autonomy ecosystem. Um, I'm going to come back to the point of uh, how the investment climate uh, looks like at the moment in terms of uh, generally investing in AI broadly. But if we have to look at, we talked about sort of the impact of AI on an everyday, uh, on our everyday lives. Uh, but we, if you have to sort of switch um, to a more commercial lens and look at what you think the biggest impact of AI in the commercial sphere uh, has been and could be uh, in the future, what would that be? Yeah, so another, another industry that I'm also, again, very excited about and, and we see a lot of opportunity is uh, AI and manufacturing. Uh, and if you think about in the idea of smart manufacturing, um, you know, some estimates put that at a $200 billion opportunity today, growing at a healthy, you know, maybe up to $300 billion or more just in the next few years. Uh, but when you think about smart manufacturing, the idea of things like uh, predictive maintenance and robotics and uh, predictive analytics, these are not new ideas. This is something that you know, people have been looking at for many, many years, both big uh, established players as well as small players. But what's different? What's different this time is we have promising AI techniques that actually work, that actually have a chance of delivering on some of the vision and promise that we've been thinking about. You take robotics as an example. Um, robotics is you know, well established in the manufacturing domain. But if you think about what it takes to train a robot to learn one task, and then what does it take to adapt it to a new task, and how do you do that in a commercially viable way, in an efficient way, in a scalable way? Well, we're starting to see some uh, line of sight of that with uh, AI techniques and being able to deploy those and to, again, get that promise of robotics and manufacturing and, and being able to do it in a scalable and, a, and an efficient way versus robots doing one task and they're very brittle and very expensive and you can't adapt them to new tasks. So that's one example. Another example is this idea of digital twins. If you think about everything happening in a manufacturing environment, whether it's in a plant or an assembly line, imagine being able to create a digital replica of all of the processes and all of the elements of your manufacturing process and then being able to run AI algorithms on those digital twins to figure out how do you make them more efficient, do you have the right manufacturing process, where are the bottlenecks? Again, this is an area where, once again, if you apply AI techniques, if you now benefit from uh, things like simulation, uh, it can finally potentially deliver on the promise of uh, more efficiency in manufacturing. And then the same thing applies to things like predictive maintenance, being able to apply AI techniques like deep learning and neural networks to be able to better ascertain what are the things you need to learn about a machine or a particular process to be able to more accurately and more robustly determine when is there going to be a failure or when are things going to break down. And I guess uh, it's quite interesting also to talk about how obviously when, whenever we think of AI in uh, advanced manufacturing, we immediately think of how does that work in terms of the growth in uh, robotics and their role in uh, the manufacturing process. But there's probably something to be said also about how uh, to apply AI in terms of monitoring uh, the work that human beings are still doing um, and how to improve uh, that uh, kind of process. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, that's actually a really good point. So, you know, robotics gets all of the, uh, the attention when we think about manufacturing. But if you think about the vast majority of manufacturing processes today, they are, in fact, manual. Uh, a perfect example is, you know, if you have an iPhone uh, and you think about how your iPhone is actually assembled, there's very little robotics happening in terms of putting that iPhone together and then shipping it out the door. So then you think about, well, it's a human task, it's a manual task, but 
do we have an opportunity to generate the right type of data and insights in terms of how humans are performing that task to be able to optimize that and to do that more efficiently. So I think that's a very interesting opportunity that is new, where if you take techniques like computer vision and you start observing what tasks humans are doing in a manufacturing setting, and then being able to uh, do analytics on that, generate the right kind of labeled data to run AI algorithms, and then you're able to maybe go and figure out how to optimize that. But more interestingly, if there is a problem, like, hey, I'm manufacturing batteries and my phones are blowing up, why is that happening? What happened to the manufacturing process for that phone when it was being put together that causes the batteries to fail? I can now go back and look at that and figure out where were the problems in my manufacturing process where humans were assembling either the battery or installing that battery in a device and to be much more quickly and efficiently be able to get to an answer as to where the problem lies. No reference to Samsung there, but <laughs> just a random example. <laughs> But it did happen, um, so you're absolutely right. Um, uh, in terms of moving on to uh, discussing um, your, your your actual day-to-day -day, uh, job, which is investing in uh, uh, these startups, uh, some of them obviously that are in the AI space, uh, we are getting some questions uh, through Pigeonhole, and maybe I can start uh, with that. So uh, there's one that actually asks, are there uh, any AI investments you would say no to? Uh, it's a great question. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you think about the filter, uh, we say no to, in fact, the overwhelming majority of companies that we meet. Every company that today has a .AI, therefore they're an AI startup. So I think as you look at things that we say no to, uh, even if you are, you know, uh, doing something really interesting in the AI space, the question is, uh, is that something that's a business, or is that something that you should be just doing in academia if you're really just doing research? So that's one one filter. Uh, you could have something very interesting in terms of AI, but then the question is, if you're doing it at a startup, uh, you know, one of the big risks today is how are you gonna compete with the tech giants that have a lot of AI talent, that have a data advantage in many scenarios? So are you in a position that you're also building some kind of data flywheel and building a data advantage in addition to having you know, world-class experts that are, uh, you know, uh, that know how to build the best algorithms? So if you may have the best algorithms, which have a high risk of getting commoditized or open source, depending on what's going on in academic research. But if you have a data advantage and you have a clear data strategy, that's something that we'll pay attention to. So that's one example of, you know, yes, we would invest in this, but we would know we would not invest in that. Um, there's another question that came through Pigeonhole, which is actually something that uh, uh, I also wanted to ask you, based on the fact that of what we've been discussing, um, the the fact that there's a there's a massive hype, there's a big, big um, a level of attention towards uh, AI at the moment. Uh, one of the questions here says, is there overinvestment in AI? It seems that investment today is diverted to buzzwords type industries. Is this a bubble waiting to implode? So if, if you follow the field of AI, there have been two winters uh, you know, before the current renaissance in AI. And there's always a risk that things are getting overhyped and overheated, and we may see another you know, trough of dis disillusionment to use the, the Gartner hype cycle terminology. But I think what's different this time is that it's not the algorithms that are new, it's the fact that we have a lot more compute and we have an explosion in data, and so we're getting real results. And we're getting, seeing those results being applied to many different industries where you, you in fact can get the right kind of data and therefore you can apply algorithms. Now that being said, there is a risk that people's expectations uh, are not matched with what you can actually accomplish today, whether it's generally in a field or in your specific business. Um, and there is some signal that you know, there has been a lot of uh, excitement about solving problem A, B, C, or D uh, using AI techniques and then realizing, well, we have a real hurdle in getting the right kind of data. Uh, you know, data preparation is probably the biggest challenges even before you can ever get the benefits of AI and machine learning. Uh, and a lot of organizations are struggling with that. And so that may cause them to maybe invest less uh, next year. Uh, I just saw, you know, a piece in VentureBeat. Only 4% of large enterprises or enterprises in general believe that they have executed on an AI strategy and realized uh, its benefits in, in terms of implementation. So lots of opportunity, but also likely a lot of people scaling back expectations. So I would say, yes, it's being hyped in terms of 
you know, it's, it's not a magic wand where you just, you know, sprinkle the pixie dust of AI and all of a sudden your problems are solved. It does require rolling up your sleeves and figuring out a data strategy. How do you take data out of silos and put it in a state that you can apply machine learning? Uh, and making that investment, and that's a journey that's different for every organization. I guess part of the conversation when we talk about, you know, are we entering a bubble or not, is uh, fundamentally the fact that we maybe could argue that the kind of metrics that would typically be used in investing in a sort of early stage investment, VC, or any, necessarily any kind of investment in, in, in a startup scenario, don't really apply in uh, the AI sphere. First of all, do you agree with that? And second of all, what are the metrics that are actually being used instead? Uh, and what kind of risks does that pose? Yeah, this, this is a very, very interesting topic and something that you know, we literally think about on a daily basis. If you look at all of the exits that we've seen with AI startups to date, they run completely counter to the, uh, the standard wisdom about building a startup, scaling it, building a business and the metrics you would use to evaluate how healthy of a business are you creating and what is the long-term outlook for that. If you look at since you know, 2013 till now, all of the largest exits have been horizontal AI companies, ones that are building an AI platform or uh, you know, have assembled the rock star team of researchers from the right institutions and are going after unsolved problems in the field of AI itself versus its vertical applications in different industries. So the question is, is this representative of the long-term trend or is this just what happens in the early stages in terms of there's a talent grab, you know, whether you're Google or you're Amazon or you're Facebook or you're Microsoft, you are, you're out there picking up these startups that have these very smart researchers, you're paying you know, a significant sum of money to do that and all of the exits we've seen thus far have been in this area. However, we do believe that this is a, a representation of where we are in the cycle, and we need to move to where companies are building sustainable, viable businesses that you would then also measure with the traditional metrics in terms of revenue growth, in terms of users, in terms of adoption, and AI is just the hammer that you're using to do it better, faster, cheaper, more efficiently than before. But we haven't seen that yet, so does that mean the you know, the opportunity is completely gone? No, I think there is still room for those smart researchers that want to build a startup, that want to compete with the tech giants, and do have a line of sight to a sustainable differentiation strategy. Maybe it's a data platform. Maybe it's a new way of collecting data and annotating data, uh, along with, you know, algorithmic breakthroughs. But the bar is really, really high. I think the vast majority of interest and expectations are that it will be the vertical AI companies that will stand up businesses and that will be uh, start to look like a, a regular startup. Um, there are actually a couple of people that have asked the same uh, question, which is a bit of a meta uh, question in the sense that um, they are asking, do you actually use AI uh, to filter or, or choose your next investment? <laughs> Uh, it's a great question. I, at, the, at the moment, um, I do not use AI for that. But if you think about being a venture capitalist, in a large part, it is a pattern matching job. You, you pattern match what you see in terms of the entrepreneurs you're betting in. You pattern match based on startups you've seen before, uh, team dynamics. So you could argue that you know, if you were to feed enough data to a pattern matching algorithm, it should give you uh, at least some insight as to are you placing the right bets. And there are tools out there uh, that are available for doing this. Um, I'm not personally using one of those today, but it doesn't mean that uh, I wouldn't do so in the future. Um, there are, have also been, obviously, larger companies that have been uh, acquiring some of these AI startups. And again, someone in the audience is uh, asking uh, this uh, question as well. Um, I mean, is the tech giant, let's say, acquiring uh, an AI startup, should we interpret that as them trying to protect themselves? Or how else could these kinds of partnerships or acquisitions um, turn into something different for the tech giant, potentially change uh, the acquirer in a way? Yeah, I, th I, I definitely think there is an element of, um, you can call it protection, but saying, if you have a mission and you have a platform that you are uh, completely or 
heavily dependent on a successful AI strategy to uh, execute on, well, then you have to go out and make sure that you have the right talent to go do that. So you can either recruit that talent, you can, um, or you can, in many cases, go and acquire companies that the, that talent exists in. So there, you can, you know, one way to position it is, yeah, you're you're maybe taking some protective measures, but I think the best AI talent that's out there would only want to join a tech giant if they believe in the mission that they're going to have at that company. Is it, is it something that you know, allows them to do what they were planning to do at their startup, but do it at a much larger scale? Uh, they have their choice to you know, get venture money or do it in academia or join a tech giant. So clearly there's an economic motivation, but there's also, you know, is, does it allow me to expand my mission or grow my mission uh, by joining forces with a tech giant? Um, I wanted to move on to talk about uh, a little bit about the risks of AI, and it's something that uh, has been discussed also in other uh, panels earlier today. Um, I guess a, a topic that we were discussing before coming on stage is the question of trust uh, when we look at the development of AI and the question also of interoperability. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how, where you see that going, and how that dynamic is developing? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a very it's a fascinating topic, and uh, I bet you know for any of the folks in the audience, if you've been following along the uh, the trends in let's go back to autonomy for for a second, I'm sure you've heard of the ethical dilemma. A self-driving car is programmed in such a way that at some point it's going to encounter a no-win scenario. It's got a, it's going to hit a really old person, or it's going to hit a child. Uh, what does it do, and how do we deal with this ethical dilemma, or how do we make sure that our autonomy, uh, autonomous or AI agents are making the right decision? And I think this is a perfect example of the symptom about trust in AI. Um, if you think about it, we don't have any law in the books that if any of you or I were in that no-win scenario, that we would be penalized differently for hitting the child versus the old lady. However, we expect AI systems to make higher standard decisions than we would hold ourselves to. So why is that? And I think the underlying reason is the ability to say we trust the decision making of an AI system because we can explain why it's making decision A versus B and we can interpret uh, the reasons and the rationale for that decision. So I think that's really the core of the issue, which is the interpretability and the explainability of AI systems and then the trust we would place in them. And it's not just about autonomy, it also applies to financial services. If you have AI involved in giving people loans or credit scores, and it's giving them one value versus another, why is it doing that? What is the rationale behind that decision? So I think that is a big, big risk, is are we building AI systems that we can trust? And then related to that is the data that we're feeding to these systems that they're using to make their decisions. Uh, as humans, we have biases. Therefore, the data that we look at also has biases. So the other key risk is where if we accumulate data to train AI systems, how do we know that there isn't an inherent bias in that data that will also then get passed on to the decisions that, that system is going to make? So I think if we think about bias and we think about interpretability and explainability, these are key risks and opportunities. And then the last one is this whole idea of privacy. Uh, if AI is fueled by data, and the data that all of us are contributing, whether it's our photos or it's um, you know, things that we're speaking into our home assistants or you know, whatever other data that's being generated, we're contributing that data to train uh, AI systems and then for them to give us results back on you know, whether we should do A, B, or C. So the question is, where do you draw the line between how much data you want to share, how identifiable that data is, and the value and the benefits that you get from AI as a result? And I think that's also an opportunity, which is can we preserve people's privacy, but at the same time allow ongoing advancements in AI, but doing it in a privacy-preserving manner? I guess my general question is how do we ensure that we don't run into these risks or that these risks don't balloon into something uh, that then becomes unmanageable? It, for instance, the question of bias. Um, is the answer as simple as making sure you have as let's say, a diverse uh, workforce as much as, as you can um, in order to ensure that the, the, the level or the magnitude of bias is uh, minimized as much as possible. But also, when we talk about privacy, who, 
how, how or what kind of institution or system uh, or standard um, should be put together or um, uh, set up in order for that kind of problem to not spiral out of control? Is it something that should be external to uh, companies involved in AI and whose responsibility is it? Um, I, so it's, it's a great question, and I think if you th you definitely see a trends in leaders in AI or putting into place some efforts to self-regulate. Um, I don't believe that's enough. I do think you need external oversight and regulation. Uh, a perfect example is in Europe, if you do something uh, where you're assigning a, a credit score or, or choosing not to lend or to lend uh, to a particular individual, you have to explain to them why that is. And so that's a regulatory uh, uh, catalyst that will then cause you to think about, well, how do we then make sure that if we're using AI to perform that function, that we are compliant with the regulation? So you absolutely need regulatory oversight. Um, and you also need to ensure that within, uh, within your own organization, there is some kind of uh, oversight committee or a board that is thinking about these issues. Um, and and you know, certainly when you think about this bias, it's, it's it, one way to say is, okay, well, let's just make sure we collect lots of data and we have the right distribution and it's diverse, but that may not be enough to be able to tease out what are the inherent biases even in a large distribution. So having a focused uh, set of either resources or uh, experts that are really thinking about what is the latest research in uh, how do we deal with bias or are looking at it more closely than just saying we'll just collect a lot of data and that will you know allow us to design bias out. Um, so it, there is no you know, one answer to this. I think it's a combination of things companies do inside combined with regulatory or government oversight. Um, I guess we're running out of time, but there uh, is one question that actually speaks to something we were discussing beforehand um, from uh, the floor, and that is, do you think AI will help to create more jobs or eliminate more jobs? And I, I know you also have quite an interesting take on that. Um, so what do you think? <laughs> So I'm an optimist. Uh, I know there is a, a lot of fear about AI automating jobs away, and, and, and it is something that is valid. However, it's not new. In other, in other transformations in society, we've had this fear, whether it was the Luddites in England or you know, when people started to see the proliferation of ATMs and they were worried about bank tellers uh, losing their jobs. Now, counterintuitively, what ended up happening uh, is that ATMs actually created more bank teller jobs because what ended up happening is banks were opening more branches. And so you still needed to have at least some tellers. And so while you may think that, you know, all of a sudden I can automate my uh, tellers away, surprisingly there were more tellers because there were more branches and there was more work to do. So I, I'm definitely in the camp of AI assisting humans, allowing humans to scale work to get better results and cooperating with humans versus autonomously completely replacing humans. Now certainly it doesn't mean that that can happen at some point, but I think in the near to midterm, that is the opportunity, which is allowing all of us to do our jobs better and to live more productive and satisfying lives by having AI actually assist us uh, to scale our work and, do, and, do our, and to do our work at a higher quality. Um. To finish off, uh, there are a couple of uh, questions that actually uh, speak to uh, the strategy that uh, obviously your own uh, fund uh, employs when uh, you go and make uh, investment decisions. Um, generally, I think the, the audience would like to know a little bit more about sort of your acquisition strategy, but also uh, there was one question about uh, how we talk a lot about ethical and other non-financial risks with AI and data collection, but how does these issues which we've discussed factor into your own investment decisions? Yeah, so I think uh, if you think about the ethics of AI and how it uh, factors into our, our decision making, you know, I'll give you a great example. And uh, back at the end of 2016, uh, M12 announced an AI for social good fund, which is to say that when we think about the ethics of AI, it should certainly be commercially motivated, but are you potentially in a position to do things to improve society? Now that could be healthcare, that could be agriculture, that could be uh, education, that could be providing more access to people in the developing world. Uh, so all of these things are examples of, uh, you know, when we think about the ethics of AI, and if you're doing, if you're building a viable business and you're doing that, well, that's certainly something we would pay attention to. 
very recently, we did an early stage AI startup competition in North America uh, and in Israel. And you know, our AI for social good winner was a early stage uh, Israeli startup that was building speech recognition models for people with speaking disabilities. Uh, so that they can communicate with all of us uh, and do so more uh, in a frictionless way than you know uh, what's happening today. Uh, so that's something you know we get inspired by, we get excited by. So that's one uh, part of it. Now, if you look at the other end of the spectrum, where you're saying, well, we're you know someone who's building a massive face recognition database, uh, and we're going to be able to tell who anyone is anywhere in a particular society. That's probably not something we're going to uh, choose to invest in. Um, so that's just a high level example. Uh, and then certainly I think if you see an opportunity to solve some of these ethical issues, interpretability of deep learning models, how do I do deep, deep learning or neural networks in a privacy preserving way where we can all contribute our data but maintain our privacy and you have some unique capabilities there and you think you can solve that that's also, you know, I think it's an interesting opportunity. Um, so those are just examples of how we think about, you know, the ethics of AI and, and how it factors into our uh, investment decisions. Well, Samir, thank you so much. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. We could be here for another hour, I think. But um, I think we've, what I've taken away from the session is that obviously, especially in AI's case and the investment scenario around it, it's obviously a very nascent market. But since it's growing so fast, I think the question of ethics and uh, things like privacy and bias are something that we should already be looking at and maybe uh, looking at more standardized oversight is definitely called for. Thank you so much, Samir, for joining us and all of you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you.